Thank you to Andrew for reading our scripture out of Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 30. And we're calling this sermon, The Model Church. I talked last week about a church that uh, I used to be a part of. Uh, I was a co-pastor of one of the congregations of Temple Baptist Church, which had a long and interesting history in downtown Los Angeles. By the time I was a part of the church, it was in the USC community, but it started downtown near Pershing Square in 1903. And when the church moved into that part of Los Angeles, it moved into what was the theater district. And at the time, it seems like the people had a, a good amount of imagination. If they were gonna move into the theater district, how would they fit in that community? And so they designed the sanctuary of the church to be a theater. And in fact, it became the Philharmonic Auditorium. It was the auditorium of the Philharmonic Orchestra of Los Angeles. And they had, during the week, they had plays, they had operas, they had all sorts of uh, concerts and everything else. And then on Sunday, they had worship in that auditorium and that remained their sanctuary through much of the 20, 20th century. And so it was actually fa fairly innovative to move into a section of a city and to fit into that city in some way. We see this in churches in the present time. Uh, a number of years ago, I went on a sabbatical and my goal was to look at churches that were self-described as emergent, which at the time was the latest term for kind of the new way to do church. And in some cases, some churches, they were uh, existing churches that just tweaked here and tweaked there so that they would have some of the characteristics of what was be calling what was being called emergent, emergent churches. But the true emergent churches were very organic. They came out of their setting. And one of the best churches, I thought one of the models of this, what emergent church looked like, was one that we visited in San Diego. And this church was one that was planted, it came out of a community. And in this community, this community was the arts district of San Diego. And it took on that feeling. They didn't have their own building. They met in the back of, a, they met in a, a lodge or something like that. But as a part of their worship experience, they incorporated a lot of visual art much attention was paid to even the things that would be put up on the screen as they went thematically, but also elegantly and artistically with what the theme of the service was. They were a congregation that welcomed all different kind of people, um, but they really reflected this part of San Diego. But they also picked on, up on what were some of the issues of this part of San Diego. And one of them was uh, there was a, a very large population of teens, teenagers, people who were young, youth, who were homeless. They had moved into, moved out to California. A lot of them were runaways. And this church began to take on a ministry to these these young people who were homeless. Eventually, this church joined a denomination. Now, this is interesting because a lot of times it's the other way around. A, an established denomination decides that they're going to plant a church in a certain area, but this was a church that planted itself in this area and then decided that it needed to have connections with a wider body. It needed to have some sense of accountability and responsibility to the church bigger than themselves, to be a part of a church family or a family of churches. And so they joined 
an established denomination. And then what ended up happening was that they became a model within that denomination of what emergent church looks like. What does a missional church look like? A church that grows organically out of the community in which they find themselves and the ministries that are there in that community. So they were a model church in many ways for that time and that place. Were they a perfect church? No, they had problems. They had problems like every church, but they were a model church. So when I talk about a model church, I'm not talking about a perfect church. I'm talking about a church that becomes a model like this is what can be done here. It's something that we can look at and maybe um, copy in a sense or follow their example. It doesn't mean they're perfect, but it is a model for how to do ministry in that place in that time. That's what we see at the Church of Antioch. They become a model. I'd like to talk about how that happens. First of all, Antioch the city, Antioch the city is a, uh, a, a, a metropolis. It's multicultural. It is a business center. It is a big place where people come and go and a lot of people have moved there because it's a central place where people move through. So trade is a big thing in that city. So that's what Antioch is like. Now, as a result of the persecution, as we're looking in the story of Acts and the persecution that comes after Stephen is martyred, and we see that a lot of the people who have become Christians, a lot of the people who are Jesus followers, they, they leave Jerusalem and they go and they spread out through the Mediterranean world. I suspect many of them went back to places where maybe they lived at one time, or maybe they have relatives or whatever. And what would happen? when they would move into these different cities, these people who had come to know Jesus, who had come to follow Jesus, would move into a new town or a new place. They would find the Jewish community within that town and they would begin to get involved in the Jewish community because they always were, even in Jerusalem, they were still involved in the synagogue and the practices of the Jewish community. They just followed Christ. And so they would look for the Jewish community and they would get involved in that community and in that synagogue. And then they would begin to share Christ. And little by little, there would become a community of believers in that, in that city or in that town. But they tended to just stay within the Jewish community within any town or city. But the people who went to Antioch, they would go, they went to Antioch and they didn't exactly play by the rules. They didn't go by the, you know, the how to plant a church in Antioch kind of thing. They, they, they went into Antioch and they began to share the gospel. They may have even started at the synagogue, but little by little, they began to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ with more than just the Jewish community. They began to share the gospel with Gentiles and Gentiles began to believe and to follow Jesus. And so now we have a community of believers, of Christ followers that are not just Jewish, they're Gentiles too. And they are together in the same community. Now, this is dramatic because we talked about last time, just the idea that Peter would eat with Cornelius was a problem for some people. And now we're talking about an entire Christian community, community of Jesus followers that are made up of people who are Jewish background and Gentile background. Some of them continue to practice the practices, the keeping kosher and all of those things. And then others, Gentiles, they have no concept of that. And so, but somehow, Within this community in Antioch, it's working. Somehow, they're able to be together 
as a community of believers, of followers of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a problem. People back in Jerusalem, word gets back there to the, the Christian community, the believers, the apostles and the believers in Jerusalem, and they're going, how can this be? How in the world can you have a community of believers that are Je Jews and Gentiles? How can that be? They just couldn't wrap their heads around it. Even though they knew that the gospel was going to Gentiles, they hadn't really thought through, or maybe they didn't want to think through all of the implications of that. But here it was, right there in Antioch, all of the implications of what it meant that those barriers, those walls were breaking down. And so here they are in Antioch, and the Jerusalem church is wondering, what do we do about this? What's really going on? And so they send Barnabas. Barnabas, who is a trusted leader by now within the Jerusalem church. Barnabas, you may remember, Barnabas was someone that was talked about way back, uh, I think in the fourth chapter, at the end of the fourth chapter of Acts. And we know his name is actually Joseph, but he's known as Barnabas because that means son of encouragement. And we see over and over and over again that that's who Barnabas is. We, he lives up to his name, the name that they have given him, son of encouragement. We see him at first giving, um, selling some land and, and giving the money from the proceeds from that sale to the apostles so that they would have the money to meet the needs of the people within the community who were in need. But then later, when Saul comes back from Damascus, and he's telling everybody that he has decided to follow Jesus and nobody believes him because he's Saul and all of the things that he has done. It is Barnabas that comes to Saul's defense. It's Barnabas who says, no, this is real. We need to believe Saul. And so it's Barnabas who is able to see through and discern that the transformation in Saul is real. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who stands up for Saul, that's who gets sent to Antioch. And when he gets to Antioch, he looks around him and he says, yeah, the Spirit of God is at work here, and we need to help support this church and this ministry in this place, this community. And so what does he do? He goes to Tarsus, where Saul was sent maybe a decade ago, and Saul was sent away because he was trouble in Jerusalem. His life was, was uh, threatened in Jerusalem, and so he went off to Tarsus, where he was from. So Barnabas goes up to Tarsus, and he finds Saul, and he brings him back to Antioch, and for a year, Barnabas and Saul become a part of this community, and they help in the teaching and the development of this community. It's a place where it grows and it thrives for that year, and they develop the leadership within that community. It becomes the first church of Antioch, and it's contrasted with the church in Jerusalem. In it's, it has leaders, it has people who are growing, it is growing, and it is uh, touching the lives of people and more and more and more people are becoming followers of Jesus. That's what it has in common with the church at Jerusalem. But what's different is that it is a church that looks like its community, just like the church at Jerusalem looks like its community. But the community of Antioch is a community that looks like the rest of the Mediterranean world. And so the church at Antioch becomes a model for what the church is gonna look like in the Mediterranean world. We need a church like that. We need a church like that, and Antioch is that church. Because the Jerusalem church isn't dealing with all of the uh, diversity that is a natural part 
of the Antioch church. And if the gospel is going to be spread, if the good news is going to go out, if people are going to become followers of Jesus, if communities are going to be healthy and are going to thrive in the Mediterranean world, they're going to have to look like the church at Antioch, not the church at Jerusalem. And so some of the characteristics that we see in the church at Antioch is, first of all, it's diverse. We have already talked about the fact that it is a church made up of people who come from backgrounds that are Jewish and Gentile. And in fact, these people, particularly the Jews, are continuing probably to practice many of their practices that they, ha that they had as, as Jews. But the Gentiles are not necessarily practicing those things. So we have the Jewish and the Gentile, the Jew and the Gentile issue, which we said continues to be an issue for decades and decades, probably another generation. But they are a church that is dealing with that. But the church is also multi-ethnic. People come from all over the Mediterranean world and even Africa. We see later on uh, in the next chapter when it talks again about the leadership of of the Antioch church, we see that the, one of them is, uh, is, his name indicates that he's probably from Africa. And so we have different, um, diff different ethnicities and even races within this church in Antioch. It reflects the kind of city that Antioch is that attracts people from all over the Mediterranean world. And so we see this diverse community. We also see that it is community that is intentional and growing because of its spiritual practices. There's teaching and there's preaching and there's praying and, and they are practicing working together and sharing with one another and praying together. They, we see gifts of discernment. We see all of these different things that are happening within that church as it grows and it thrives. And so it is a spiritually vital community. It also has a reputation. People are beginning to notice this community of Christians and for better or worse, this is the first place they're called Christians. Now it's kind of like uh, when you look at the uh, historically the people that are called the Shakers or even the people that are called the Quakers. The Quakers, uh, their actual name is the Friends, but everybody has called them the Quakers and it sticks. It sticks, the name sticks. In the same way, the community calls them Christians like little Christs or you know, it was not necessarily complimentary, it was, but, but it was what people started to call them. They called themselves the way, which has some uh, roots within the uh, Hebrew scriptures. They call themselves that, but everybody else starts to call them Christians, and after a while, it sticks. And we still, to this day, call ourselves Christians. But they had a reputation within the community. They were known with the, in, within the, the larger area that they were a community of Jesus followers, Christians. They were also connected with the larger family. Not only do we have the leadership through Barnabas and then eventually Saul coming from different parts to this place, to continue to help the community to grow. We have, we have prophets that come from the Church of Jerusalem and they tell what's going to be happening and they predict that there's going to be a famine. And so the church gets together and they begin to think about what are they going to do about it. And they don't just think about, well, okay, we need to save this and we need to preserve that and we need to prepare ourselves for this famine. No, they think about who's going to be most dramatically impacted and they decide that the people back in Jerusalem are going to be the ones most dramatically impacted by this. And so they take an offering and they take the offering and they send Paul, Saul, and Barnabas with that offering back to the church at Jerusalem. There's a connection, not so much even an obligation, except that we are family and we need to take care of each other. They had a sense of being a part of something bigger. 
it wasn't just self-preservation, but it was, we have connections and responsibilities toward people who are part of our family, even though they don't live in Antioch. And so they were connected to the larger family. They were also mission oriented. What we read later on in the next chapter, the leaders get together and while they're praying, the Holy Spirit tells them to set aside Barnabas and Saul for a mission. Set them aside and send them out into the Mediterranean world as they travel a team of them under the leadership of Barnabas and Saul to go out and share the good news of Jesus. They take their best teachers, their most experienced teachers, and the Holy Spirit says, send them out and share them with the world, and they do. They take their most, some of their most talented, and they send them out so that others can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They are meant they are mission oriented and then they become the home base. As the missionaries go out and they share the gospel, they come back to the church at Antioch. At Antioch. They become the home base for the mission to the Mediterranean world. And I think most important, we see that this church is nimble. This church has a healthy attitude toward tradition, but they are not held back by it. They probably had to deal with all of the traditions that came out of the Christians that came from Jerusalem and came from Israel, came out of the Jewish tradition. They had, those were strong traditions, but they were not limited by them. They were able to move and become nimble and, and, and adapt to what are the verse circumstances so that they could accomplish the mission that God gave them. They were nimble, and this showed that they were healthy. Do churches today resemble Antioch? Do churches have these kinds of characteristics? And now, as we're dealing with COVID-19 and how it has impacted the church, the church Big C and our church, in Redlands, as we look at how we are being impacted by this um, unprecedented catastrophe within our world right now, something that we didn't plan for, something that we didn't read about in our church growth books or anything like that, nothing that we learned in seminary, and within a very short time, we have had to move and change in order to adapt. And we've done that. I think in a lot of ways, COVID-19, this experience that we're having has tested us, has asked us the question, are we able to change? Are we nimble enough? Do we have a sense of who we are? Do we have the spiritual practices that undergird us as a church? Do we have the connections? Do we have a sense of what our mission is? Are we able to then move from all of the normal ways that we have done things to a completely different way to do things and still think about how we can be the people of God in this place? I think COVID-19 is testing us and asking us this question. And from week to week to week, we think, well, maybe, maybe so. But we also have to ask our ourselves the question, are we just surviving? Or are we at a place where we begin to think about, okay, we're all here, look around us, now what? Now, what do we do in these circumstances, in these times that are uncertain in so many different ways? How can we accomplish the mission that God has given us even when we can't be in our building? It's a test. 
but it's also a tool. The reality is whenever we completely get out of this COVID-19 thing, we will always be living with the results. We will be living, we will not go back to what we call normal. We won't, we can't. It's gonna be different. And I know that's scary to even talk about that it's going to be different, different. but I think that we need to move. We need to be thinking about these things. We need to realize that a couple years from now, we, stay, we still may be dealing with the results of COVID-19 and its impact on our community and on our world. We no doubt will be. And we will be changed as a result of it. We as people and we as a community and we as Christians, we as a church will be changed as a result. The question is, will we be better? The question is, will we have moved to a new place that enables us to do the kind of ministry in the future that we're called to do that maybe we would have not been prepared for had we not had this season of COVID-19? And so COVID-19 this season, it may be proving to be a test. And I'm not saying all of these things like God has sent COVID-19 to test us, but it's one of the realities of the world and it's a big one. And how are we doing? It's when we go through hard times that we find out how we're doing. But is it also a tool? Are we learning things during this time that will help us to move into a future? A future where God will use this church like God has used this church for decades and decades and decades in seasons and out of season, in different types of, uh, in different types of ages with different types of problems and all different kinds of tools and innovations. Are we like the church at Antioch? Do we thrive in our diversity? Are we, are we involved in spiritual practices that help us to continue to grow and to have a deeper and deeper relationship with God and with each other? What is our reputation in the community? Do people even know we're here? Are we connected to a larger family with a sense of responsibility and mission that goes beyond our walls, that connects with people as brothers and sisters in Christ to impact the world? Do we care about the wider family? Are we mission oriented? Do we look around us and we see what God is calling us to do? Do we see the work that God is doing and wants to do? And do we jump in and get involved? Are we willing to give up our brightest and our best to go out and do the work of the kingdom of God? And are we nimble? Are we able to adapt? Are we able to change? Are we able to see what's really important? what our values are, and then move and change and make it, make, be innovative and maybe even make mistakes. Are we nimble? Our goal is not to get back to normal, but we are to be and become an effective instrument of God for the sake of God's kingdom. A model church? <laughs>